Joining us now for what Brief and the review of some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Adefemi Akinsoya. Good morning, Adefemi. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Ruben. Good morning, Ayo. Good, Good morning, Rufai. Febi, Febu. Oh, come on. You can't sing for me today Febu. because it's oh, me that should be singing man. for you today. <laughs> I saw your haircut and gave it a lovely compliment. You know, in London, Thank we call you. it a shape up. I don't know yeah. what they call it in London, but you call it a nice shape up. So I like your shape yeah, up, Rufai. We call it low cut. A low cut in Lagos. <laughs> very, very nice. Good morning to you all. Morning. Let's take a look about what's happening around the world. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris indicated in a CBS News 60 Minutes interview aired on Monday of the night that she could get her economic policies through a Republican-controlled Congress despite the potential for opposition from Republican lawmakers to her proposed tax breaks that take up the federal deficit. Now, this is 60 Minutes interview is the second time in recent weeks Harris has been asked to describe how she would fund her policies, which could add $3 trillion to the U.S. national deficit over the next decade. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. My plan is about saying that when you invest in small businesses, you invest in the middle class, and you strengthen America's economy. Small businesses are part of the backbone of America's mm -hmm. economy. But, but pardon me, Madam Vice President. I, the, the question was, how are you going to pay for it? Well, one of the things is I'm going to make sure that the richest among us who can afford it pay their fair share in taxes. It is not right that teachers and nurses and firefighters are paying a higher tax rate than billionaires and the biggest corporations. But, and but, I plan on making that fair. But we're dealing with the real world here. But the real world includes... How are you going to get this through Congress? You know, when you talk quietly with a lot of folks in Congress, they know exactly what I'm talking about because their constituents know exactly what I'm talking about. Their constituents are those firefighters and teachers and nurses. As you heard there, Kamala Harris's responses were a little shaky in some parts of the interview. Now, Kamala Harris was also pressed on issues including the Middle East, Ukraine, gun ownership and immigration. Now, the pre-recorded interview comes as Harris ramps up media appearances on a series of podcasts and TV networks amid criticism that she has made very few. And this is why I've been telling you that the US presidential candidates have been watching the Rise News because they've been listening to you guys saying that she needs to be doing more interviews. So if we... Um, continue on with Donald Trump. We do know that Donald Trump was also actually invited to speak at um, CBS's 16 Minutes, but he actually declined um, his own interview. Speaking of Donald Trump, he has suggested that people living illegally in the United States who commit murder have bad genes. That's a direct quote from the former president. In a radio interview with conservative radio host Hugh Hewitt, the Republican presidential nominee repeated claims that he's made before, which is that the Biden-Harris administration has allowed murderers to enter the country. Also, following Hurricane Helene and with another storm actually on the way, Trump is also falsely claiming that the White House is diverting disaster relief aid to unrelated migrant programs. Now, this is false, but Trump, while president, we do cast our minds back to that, he did actually repurpose FEMA funds in order to finance his hardline immigration policies there. So a bit of irony uh, when we see uh, the rhetoric coming out of the former president as we come into the last stretch of campaigning ahead of the November 5th election day to the African continent now, and Ethiopia's parliament has approved the appointment of a new president to replace the country's first female head of state, Saleh Wak Zwede. Now, the new president is Taye Astike Selassie, who has worked for the UN and has a close relationship with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and has been Ethiopia's foreign minister since February. He's taken up what is largely a ceremonial role. But in Ethiopia, political power, as we know, lies with Prime Minister, who is currently Abiy Ahmed. Now, Sally Wok, who we see on the screen here, she had reportedly fallen out with Abiy in recent years. The Prime Minister's backing of her initial appointment back in 2018 was hailed as a huge breakthrough for gender equality in Ethiopian politics. 
However, over the weekend, Sally Wok posted a message on X, formerly known as Twitter, implying that she was unhappy as a result of staying silent for the past year. Now, during her presidency, she made several calls for peace across the country, though she was criticized for not speaking more specifically about gender-based violence and rape being perpetuated during the two-year civil war in the Tigray region. <laughs> there was no way she could have spoken up about it now well, because it was Abiy-led people mm -hmm. that were perpetrating that gender-based violence and a lot of that rape in the Tigray region because of the fight that was on the ground. So, right. And I'm sure she's saying she was silenced. She should know that the role of the president in Ethiopia was largely ceremonial all this while. And most of the powers did rest, you know, but as a titular head of state, it's now limited Africa to only one, and that's... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Salihu uh, of uh, Tanzania. Tanzania, Tanzania, yes, Samia Saluhu. But, but, but as regards um, um, Kamala Harris, for me, Americans, like I say, are the greatest losers in this election because mm. you have two presidential candidates that will, cause, that will put America in a big pickle. Right. One is unstable. This other one does not even know her policies. Mm. And I'm talking about Kamala. I mean, look at the question as regards... How are you going to singly pay for the deficit? I was expecting Kamala to now be able to bring her bipartisan record to bear in selling it. Also saying that this is one of the reasons why they're going to also ensure mm. that they win the Senate in this coming elections. Right. And I also expected Kamala to be able to say, okay, a fair amount this is how much we are going to get. Because you see, two of them, their plans together will increase the deficit. How do we increase the deficit by like 3.5 trillion? Yes. Over the next 10 years, his will increase the deficit by like 7.58 trillion. So, this was where I expected her to be able to have a grasp of her plan. But, like in other interviews, and this is my fear about Kamala, she doesn't know the plan. She just thinks she can smile it off and, you know, no, 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 no. We're talking about serious business. And that's why I say a handlers should be able to do that serious work. But you know, some people in our defense say, you know, all politicians do it. They try as much as get possible to get to the center because they win election. They pivot here and there. But really, I refer people to go and watch John McCain and Obama's debate, or mm -hmm. Obama. Rep. And that's why I said, on the bounce, when you talk about candidates that had solid stuff, the last time I saw that really play out in American politics was the likes of the Obama Mitt Romney days. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, it's just been a slippery slope. Right on Kamala Harris, just even from the short extract from the interview, you will see that she, even beyond being able to articulate her policies, it was even that demonstration as a, as a, as a presidential right. appearance. And I don't think that shone, very th um, no. shone quite brightly there. And that's one of the criticisms on her path. I mean, this is the most powerful seat perhaps in the world currently. Sure. And so if you're going to inspire confidence in people to believe in you, then beyond just being able to answer questions, you must also be seen to be tough, to be firm, to be able to mm -hmm. take charge of situations. And that did, this interview didn't do her any service. I had said before we came on, air that it's almost seeming like what Trump said about her is true. That she came, it was the initial honeymoon period and that's a while it was going to fizzle out. And if she's not careful to be able to build on the solid support she, she came into the race with, I am very concerned about what her performance would be like in just a month. On the 5th of November, in fact, less than a month, Americans are going to go to polls to elect their new, you know, Correct. the new president. New so leader. she has a lot of grounds to cover. She, she has put herself forward to other interviews, but friendlier interviews, lighthearted, yes. nothing really, Podcasts. you know, that, the view and, and things like that, podcasts and all, all. I don't know if she would be able to convince Americans. At least so far, she hasn't yet been able to justify convincingly mm -hmm. how she's going to pay for her policies. What she responded there was that, oh, the you know, the rich will pay for the poor. How? It it almost yep. seems like when we were interviewing, when we were interviewing um, presidential election candidates Correct. in Nigeria, we asked them, or governorship candidates, how? You have these lofty, exactly. lofty plans. And she wasn't able to convincingly tell. Even the host was looking at her like, What's going mm, on? What's going on, Kamal? But then with Ethiopia, sad news there. And, yes. it's, and it's quite curious because by the end of this month, Sally Walk could have ended her Correct. tenure. So things must have been really bad for he, her to have been replaced without her at least finishing her tenure at the end of the month. Exactly. He could have waited. But, you know, um, Prime Minister Abiy has a lot on his hands. Um, he still has to ju justify his Nobel um, Prize Peace, that he won exactly. here in 2019, seeing that, unfortunately... It's not very peaceful at the moment in Ethiopia. No. He has the Amara conflict to deal with. But yes, um, sad that she wasn't able to end her tenure properly. There is that. Okay, let's dismiss Ethiopia very quickly. Yeah. 
The issue is that uh, Sarah Wed was not uh, saying enough about conflicts that uh, you know uh, Ethiopia is dealing with in the Amhara region and in the Tigray region. But she has served six years, first woman president in Ethiopia. You know, providing that uh, image of uh, gender balancing. <laughs> and in any case, uh, she's not leaving the office with her head unbowed. The African Union Commission, through its uh, chairman, Jefferson, mm -hmm. has said that they welcome the development. And everyone looks forward to what the new president, Taiwo, you know, uh, Tawo. Tayu. Yeah, well, Tayu. You know, it, it could be a Yoruba man with all of these names. I mean, goodness Tayu. gracious. You know, we do. Yeah, that's, that's, yes. that's nothing about that. You know, so, but in Ethiopia, you know, they, they face very serious conflict issues. And the president, even though it's a ceremonial position, mm. will be expected to speak up more in support of the administration. But she has had a six year run, mm -hmm. and I think that she should be commended for the service that she has provided and for the symbolism and significance of her representation Correct. along gender lines and in terms of uh, you know contributions. Now quickly, uh, Kamala Harris. Now in the last few weeks, what the uh, Democratic campaign for Kamala Harris has been doing is to present her in front of uh, friendly interviewers and hosts and targeted audiences. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, she was with uh, Alex Cooper. Yes. Of, uh, Call Me Daddy. Podcast. Podcast, yes. you know, and then that went live on Sunday. On Tuesday, today, she's going to be on uh, ABC's uh, The View. Mm -hmm. uh, later this week, on Thursday, she's going to be on Univision Town Hall. So this is the uh, strategy to give her exposure in terms of friendly interviewers yes. and targeted audiences to boost our ratings as uh, we, we go down, uh, I think it's about just a month now to the election. Yes. Now, what are the big takeaways in that CBS 60 Minutes interview? I think that's what should, we should focus on. Right. She was asked questions about the economy. Well, I don't think she said anything significant in that regard. Two, she was asked... Uh, uh, questions about whether she met, she would meet with Putin to resolve the problem. And she said, well, Ukraine will be the country to take the decision about what happens in that uh, particular matter. Yeah. In other words, she provided, she said, our administration will provide support for Ukraine. She was asked whether Ukraine should be admitted into NATO. She more or less said, well, when we get to that bridge, we will cross it. You know, in other words, that's, that's she real fighting the question. Talk. <laughs> Number two, the question was asked whether, you know, she would uh, sit down with Putin. She said no. Mm -hmm. She has no intention to sit down with Putin. That, in fact, if uh, the situation were different, by now, uh, Donald Trump will be sitting down with uh, Putin. Two features were played, one with Liz Cheney you know, who is the Republican from Wyoming, mm -hmm. where, you know, Republican Party was said to have started. Yes. And she said, oh, she appreciates uh, Liz Cheney supporting her. Liz Cheney is undergoing investigation uh, over her role in the Capitol uh, January 6th invasion. Uh, but she says, well, she appreciates uh, Liz Cheney supporting her. There was also a footage about uh, Walls, the uh, running mate, and then she said, well, you know, well, Waz has been told to be careful about what he says, <laughs> claiming that he has been in China and Hong Kong and uh, all of that. And then, of course, she slammed Donald Trump for dropping out of the uh, 60 Minutes CBS. Yes. Now, Donald Trump has been very careful. He doesn't go to places <laughs> he thinks they will be unfriendly. Mm -hmm. In uh, 2020, he was on CBS 60 Minutes, he but he thought that the uh, interviewer was hostile. He walked out of the interview. So it's understandable that he's running away uh, from uh, CBS 60 Minutes, but he would rather go to Fox News. Sure. He will go to other places that he considers friendly. But, you know, we're down to the wire we are. with the uh, U.S. elections. About 30 days to go. So we'll see 
Without. Very interesting times ahead. Thank you very much for all of your comments. Yay. Let's take a look at the front page of this day. The front page of this day is dominated by political stories this morning from River State, where the fallout from local government elections has prompted President Tinubu to condemn the violence while ordering the Inspector General of Police to secure LGA offices. Now, it also talks about Edo State, where the People's Democratic Party has accused INEC of doctoring Bivas to conceal vote rigging during the gubernatorial elections last month. Month. The New Telegraph sings the same tune as far as Rivers is concerned with a quote from State Governor Sim Fubara who tells his predecessor Ye Sonwike that he cannot win all fights and that he should let go of River State for the sake of peace. This is as LGAs in Ikwere and Beme have been set ablaze. The Guardian also leads with the crisis in rivers. But the story that jumps out at me is NAFTAC. That's the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control. It's been lauding its codex food labeling standards, saying it offers a range of benefits that enhances food safety and consumer awareness globally by eliminating misleading food descriptions uh, on products. All of this, though, is happening while workers at NAFTAC have initiated an indefinite strike due to unresolved promotion and welfare concerns. The decision to strike comes after multiple meetings with NAFTAC management yielded no positive outcomes regarding critical issues affecting staff. The Daily Trust features on its front page a story about how airfares for travellers going to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj pilgrimage will reach 10 million naira as the federal government stops its subsidy. Now, the government's subsidy is mostly in the form of a concessionary rate which allows pilgrims to access dollars at a reduced rate from the central bank. Our national, the National Hajj Commission of Nigeria is yet to announce the Hajj Fair for 2025. States uh, Pilgrim Welfare Board have begun asking intended pilgrims to pay 8.5 million naira as an initial deposit pending the announcement of the Hajj Fair. The statement also announced the refund of 64,682 naira, which is approximately 150 Saudi Riyal, to every Nigerian pilgrim that participated in the 2023 Hajj. So a whole lot of money it's going to take for people wanting to go to Hajj next year. Mm. The punch now leads with this Naira for crude issue as the federal government proposes a six-month supply for the Dangote refinery. Now this renews fears and concerns over the NMPCL's sole petrol buyer's role. Uh, the refinery will reportedly get 24 million barrels in two months. Let's move on to some African papers. And the Daily Graphic of Ghana leads with the country's crackdown on illegal mining, which is referred to as Galamsey in the country. President Nana Akufo-Addo has ordered military and police deployment to flush out illegal miners from bodies of water and forest reserves in the country, which remain red zones to mining activities. To Kenya. The Daily Nation of Kenya reports that it is D-Day. Deputy President Regathi Gashaga has laid out his defense, poking holes in the charges that have been laid out against him in this impeachment motion that is currently before the National Assembly's. Uh, MPs will take a vote to decide his fate today. Mm. And then the eye of the UK has Keir Starmer refusing to rule out UK military involvement if Israel attacks Iran. Now, these strong comments have called for uh, UK involvement to be approved first by MPs. But what's very interesting to note is that in the not too distant past, you remember we were discussing about mm. how the UK doesn't actually have the military funding, yeah. the backing uh, to spend uh, or to involve itself in any type of war. And, you know, it does recall memory of what... Uh, what do you call him? Tony Blair did. Uh, I don't know if Keir Starmer wants to add going to war as part of his political legacy within 100 days of his <laughs> leadership. And uh, then let's move on to the Daily <laughs> Express. Got so much drama already. Exactly. So the Daily Express finally pictures uh, protesting pensioners, and they are protesting to protect the winter fuel cut together with unions and charities. And the crowd were chanting, Keir Starmer, don't be cruel, give us back our winter fuel. All right, thank you so much for Always breaking it down for us. No it's always great to hear you uh, review today's uh, the day's newspaper.